Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, November 11th, 2013, and here are our top stories. Tonight, how the feds are tapping much more than your phone. Then, InfoWars pays homage to our veterans. And even John McCain has issues with the NSA. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, on this Veterans Day, we need to remember that Forbes has reported that a million veterans from the Iraq and Afghanistan war are injured. All that can be said with certainty is that as of last December, more than 900,000 servicemen and women had been treated at the Department of Veterans Affairs hospitals and clinics since returning from war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the monthly rate of new patients being added as of the end of 2012 was around 10,000 per month. But then in March, the VA abruptly stopped releasing statistics on war casualties. However, experts say there is no reason to suspect that the monthly rate of new patients has changed. So before we commit to future wars, let's remember how we were lied to to get into these wars, and let's remember the real cost of these wars. Now, the U.S. military is being used in other ways in the Philippines. They're being used to provide relief after a record typhoon hits that area this weekend. It was reported that the typhoon is unofficially the strongest recorded tropical cyclone to hit land with speeds up to 195 miles per hour. And we're getting various reports from the number of deaths ranging anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000. There's a lot of reports that it's 10,000, but nothing is certain yet except it's absolute total chaos. The infrastructure has been wiped out. And we should remember that even though we're able to provide relief now, and even though the U.S. military is able to provide some relief, historically what we've seen increasingly in the United States is that when we have a large disaster, FEMA doesn't do a very good job of getting the relief there. They tend to be a bottleneck more than a facilitator, because you've got to remember that FEMA's primary responsibility is continuance of government. COG is what they're mainly concerned with. So when you look at this devastation in the Philippines, you should think about what you have done to provide for food for your family whenever we have an interruption of our fragile infrastructure, our fragile grid, and to think about the fact that not only can you set aside things to prepare for your family, but you can also set aside things to help other people who are less fortunate than you are in these situations. Now, it may be very hard in the Philippines right now, and in the U.S., people on Main Street are struggling, but not the people on Wall Street. The Standard & Poor's 500 index has climbed 108% since Obama became president, adding more than $10 trillion in equity market value, just and 24% just this year. But we need to understand that this is another stock market bubble. And we need to understand that this is not something that is helping people on Main Street. People are still losing their jobs, they're still losing their homes. This is something that is helping Wall Street, and it's a big boom to K Street, to the lobbyists, to the Washington politicians who are getting paid by the big corporations, by the big banks who are giving a pass on legislation that would have curbed in the abuses that led to the crash in 2008. And we saw earlier this year, back in the spring, we saw that the Stock Act that Congress passed to a lot of fanfare that was going to rein in insider trading in Washington. It was going to provide transparency as to which stocks congressmen and their staff were buying. That was all quietly taken away this spring. And now we see that just 12 days ago, Congress got rid of another piece of legislation that was going to rein in the abuses of prior to 2008 and the last bubble that we saw. As part of the Dodd-Frank bill, they had prohibited only about 10% of the derivative trading that had happened prior to 2008, but now even that is gone. House Bill 922 passed with 70 Democrats and all the Republican congressmen except Walter Jones, John Duncan, and Tom Massey. They all voted to allow the banks to wildly speculate yet again. So Obama is really performing well for his masters. That would be the big banks, the big insurance companies. All those reforms that they talked about, that they bragged about, Dodd-Frank, the Stock Act, all those have been quietly done away with while nobody was looking. And if you think it would have been any different if we would have had McCain, consider the fact that all of the Republicans, except those three that I just named, 
all the Republicans in the House voted to get rid of the derivatives restrictions. And it was only about 10 percent of the derivative restrictions that were even put on there by Dodd and Frank. They got rid of even those. And it's not just our money that would have been affected with McCain in the same way. It's also our liberties. Look at this story. He came out today and said that the NSA chief should be fired. He said that Keith Alexander, the head of the United States National Security Agency, should be fired or forced to resign for letting contractor Ed Snowden have access to the information he ultimately leaked. Now see, he's saying that he should be fired because that information got out. Not that he should be fired because he acted illegally, because he spied on all Americans in a dragnet manner, because he violated everybody's Fourth Amendment. No, he should be, spy he should be fired because that information got out because he embarrassed McCain and the rest of them. But actually, McCain's not really embarrassed. When they asked him about the spying on Angela Merkel, the prime minister from Germany, he said uh, they did it because they could do it. <laughs> That's an amazing admission. There's not any controlling legal authority on them. It's just if they've got the capability to do it, they do it. He pointed out these are people with enhanced capabilities that they've developed over the last decade or so. And so they were sitting around and said, we can do it. So they just did it, said the senator. And obviously he doesn't have any problem with that. He only has a problem with the fact that we found out about it. And then of Snowden in Russia, he said, it's a slap in the face of all Americans. Now is the time to fundamentally rethink our relationship with Putin's Russia. See, he thinks that it's a slap in the face of Americans that someone who is blowing the whistle on illegal activity, activity had to escape to Russia. No, the slap in the face is that they refuse to do anything about it. They allow high-ranking officials to lie to Congress, which is a felony, and nothing is done about it. They merely get mad about the fact that these criminal actions were exposed. Now, we also had Representative Sissenbrenner go to the European Parliament and slam the NSA. And this is kind of unusual because this is the same Sissenbrenner who introduced the Patriot Act. He authorized the Real ID Act. And he even walked out of the House committee hearings one time on Gitmo because they were talking about human rights violations. He didn't want to talk about this. This is also the Sensenbrenner who advocated last year amending the Espionage Act of 1917 to enable the prosecution of journalists. So Sensenbrenner goes to the European Parliament and he says that he's now going to introduce the uniting and strengthening America by fulfilling rights and ending eavesdropping, dragnet collection, and online monitoring act. He calls it the USA Freedom Act. They love to come up with these contrived acronyms that are absolutely ridiculous. He says the title intentionally echoes the Patriot Act because it does what the Patriot Act was meant to do, strike a proper balance between civil liberties and national security. That is the big lie. You do not balance liberty against security. If you give up your liberty, all you're going to get is slavery. There is no balancing act here. And this is from the same person who has given us nothing but encroachments, massive encroachments on our civil liberties, destroying the Constitution. And now he's got some act that he claims is going to get everything back in some kind of a phony balance. What's going on is six days ago, he announced that he's running for reelection. He knows which way the wind's blowing. He knows that people are upset about what the NSA is doing. And so he's merely trying to cover for himself, saying that even he is concerned about the direction that his own legislation has taken. But look at this story from Paul Joseph Watson. The feds are now deploying national spy system of microphones capable of recording conversations. He says the revelations of Ed Snowden shown fresh light on NSA spying targeting the American people, but what has gone largely unnoticed is the fact that a network of different spy systems, which can record real-time conversations in public, are already in place throughout many urban areas of the U.S., as well as in technology products that we buy and use on a regular basis. They are no secret, but they are hiding in plain view. Now, if you remember back to the video that we've referred to many times and we showed many times here at InfoWars, the one where Tom Mabe, the comedian, went around and he had headphones, he had a boom mic and a wires so that looked like he was recording. He's dressed up like a Secret Service agent in a black suit with black sunglasses. But they're actually doing it the same way that Tom Mabe did in his comedy skit. The only difference is you don't see a man there. And the only difference is, is that the technology is much better than one man standing over your 
the two of you with a microphone. Well, coming up right after the break, we've got more on Veterans Day and the Obamacare scandals keep piling up. Stay tuned. Well, today is Veterans Day, and Jakari Jackson talked to some veterans about Second Amendment issues. Sir, what brings you out here today? Oh, the Veterans uh, Day Memorial Ceremony. And you serve? Yes, I do. I, I still currently serve. Okay, sir. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Texas Army please. National Guard, part of the Texas Military Forces. Well, I'm a veteran, and uh, I'm participating in the parade, and I'm going to present the wreath to the unknown veterans. And do you have any firearms with you today, sir? Oh, no, I don't have any with me today. Okay. Didn't need any today. Yeah, you didn't need them today. All right, what do you think about all the recent gun legislation? You know, we've had the tax at the schools and the malls, and a lot of people are trying to take the guns away. Do you think that's a good thing to take the guns away? Uh, no, I sure don't. I fully believe in the Second Amendment. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the news about firearms and why we need uh, essentially assault weapons. Do you agree that we need to ban assault weapons? I agree that every person should be entitled to carry whatever weapon he wants. This is a law. It's basically a disposable bazooka. Disposable bazooka? Yeah, they, when they phased out the 3.5 rocket, which was a bazooka that carried a nom, we actually started using these. I've seen reports about people in the military not being able to observe their faith. Uh, their faith rights being suppressed. I don't think it's okay. I think people should be given the opportunity to uh, practice their religion as long as it doesn't uh, offend other people or other religions. Oh yeah, they should. They should be able to observe their own faith no matter what religion it is because this is a free country. Well, another week and even more Obamacare scandals. Gigi Ornetta has an update. I'm Gigi Ornetta with Tyranny Watch on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, over the last few days, three 20-year-olds built a website much like healthcare.gov. You can actually log on to it and find out how much health insurance will cost you. On the website, you'll see that the insurance purchaser can decide if they want to buy. And if they do, the information on how to do it is available right there on healthsherpa.com. Don't worry, if Obamacare collapses, guess who pays for it? Last week on the Incidental Economist blog, Adriana McIntyre explained a provision buried in the health care law called the Risk Corridor. It's one of Obamacare's three R's, along with reinsurance and risk adjustment, that are intended to protect insurers, especially in Obamacare's first three years. Risk adjustment and reinsurance both require profitable health plans to share risk with unprofitable ones. In the event of a widespread failure, taxpayers potentially face a multi-billion dollar bailout of health insurers. And Kathleen Sebelius is in the hot seat again. On Wednesday, they start the hearings in which she's going to continue testifying, and two scandals may actually come up. The first one is Enroll America. You may have heard of it. First, federal law prohibits governmental regulators, such as HHS, from soliciting funds from entities that they regulate. Sibelius claims she did not solicit from these HHS regulated groups, but admits to contacting them and talking to them about Enroll America. And for scandal number two, you may have heard the name Anthony Welters. He's a huge Obama donor and a regular at the White House. He's also the executive vice president of a company named United Health Group. He's already made millions from Obamacare because United Health Group owns QSSI, a software company responsible for a large portion of healthcare.gov. There's also something called an anti-kickback law, which Sibelius seems to think that Welters is immune to. Kathleen Sibelius will be answering questions about these scandals and other things this week as she continues to explain her management of Obamacare. I'm Gigi Arnetta for Tyranny Watch on the InfoWars Nightly News. Stick around. Right after the break, we're going to have an extended interview with G. Edward Griffin on the origins, the secret origins of the Federal Reserve, and also a special report from Leanne McAdoo about another secret organization that's starting up, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Stay tuned. Well, G. Edward Griffin has done a lot of things in his life. He's most well known as a filmmaker and an author. And probably his most famous work is his work about the Federal Reserve, The Creature from Jekyll Island. He's our guest today, and we're going to talk to him about the history 
of the Federal Reserve and what, if anything, can be done about it as we approach the 100th anniversary of its creation. Welcome, Mr. Griffin. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. So give us a real quick summary. I know you've written an entire book about the creation of the Federal Reserve, but can you give people a real quick summary of kind of the secretive origins of this uh, organization and what it is in essence? Well, yeah, David, I think the key word there was secretive origins. Uh, that is a it's not only an interesting, uh, exciting part of the story, but it also is, is loaded with information because, you know, when things are done in secret, and as indeed the creation of the Federal Reserve System was, when things are done in secret, there's usually something to hide. And uh, that adds a little mystery to the whole thing, doesn't it? It certainly Absolutely. did for me. Yeah, when, and when we've, got was, a, we've got a big trade agreement that's being negotiated in secret now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, that's that's yeah. very frightening how secretive they've been oh, yeah. on that. It's, it's really it, kept under, under lock and key. Even though people know about it, they still can't look into it. Yes, it's a little different level because now they're just saying, well, these are things that are not for the public to know because of national security or things right. like that. Right. We, we know what's going on. We just don't know what the details are. But back in 19... 10 to 1913 in that time period when they were actually creating the Federal Reserve, it was so secret that they denied that anything was going on at all. That's you right. Know, you know, oh, it's a, some kind of a conspiracy theory, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it, so, was. it was. It was a conspiracy. It just wasn't a theory, right? It wasn't a theory. It was history. <laughs> mm -hmm, right. Anyway, history unfolding. And so I knew nothing of this, of course. But when I started to research and I found out that the Federal Reserve was, in fact, created under conditions of extreme secrecy, so much so that it wasn't even done in Washington, in D.C., where you might expect. It was done on a, a private island mm -hmm. off the coast of Georgia, Jekyll Island, as a matter of fact. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? What's this all about? <laughs> well, to make a long story short, w once I discovered the reason for the secrecy, then all the pieces fell into place very quickly. Uh, everything we need to know, I think, today even, a hundred years later, everything we really need to know about the Federal Reserve uh, that unlocks the mystery of all these crazy things we think they're crazy uh, that they're doing. Uh, what's this Federal Reserve doing? Don't they know that's not good for America? Don't they know that's not good for Americans? It's not good for the economy? Don't they know that? Are they all stupid, you know? Isn't We're that trying... always the case? We always <laughs> say, what are they doing? This is absolutely the opposite of what they should be doing because in so many areas areas of government over and over again, they tell us that something is created to do X, and yet it has a completely different agenda that is yeah. completely different than what the public believes, and that certainly is the case of the Federal Reserve, isn't it? Yes, it is, and that's the whole point. I mean, we're so stupid, we actually believe them when they tell us that it, it's supposed to do a certain thing. We think, right. oh, well, they're honorable men. Uh, we elected them, and we wouldn't vote for a dishonorable person, would we? So since we elected <laughs> them, we, we purified them with our vote. You know, We sanctified them. So when they tell us something, we think, well, that must be true. Right. Well, anyway, uh, th this all is not new. It goes back at least 100 years to the Federal Reserve. It goes back before that, unfortunately. But anyway, um, everything we need to know really about this mystery uh, uh, that's unfolding today uh, is answered in the details of that secret meeting back in 1910. So the, the, I'll give you the nuts and bolts of it. Um, because I, I know we got to get on to more important things, but I think it's I think it's important to know where we were. Right. If we know where we are, which is hard enough to figure that out sometimes. That's right. But if, if all we know is where we are, we don't know which direction we're heading. Mm -hmm. In order to get a sense of direction, is to find out where we're going to be. We have to know where we came from, so we can get two points lined up, and then have a straight line, and we can see where we're headed. So we need to go back in history now and then, and so we go back to 1910, and we find out that uh, back in those days there was a great deal of concern among the American people about the the economy, they're about the banking system in particular, about the money system, about credit. They were concerned about this concentration of financial power in the hands of a few huge firms on Wall Street, banks and insurance companies and brokerage houses. And they knew that somehow there's these very wealthy, powerful um, financiers were dominating the country because they had control over uh, the flow of money and credit and everything. And they said, we've got to break this because we mm -hmm. know it's, it's, it's not good for America. So there was a, a pressure at that time 
to what they call break the grip of the money trust. That mm -hmm. was a phrase that it was used over and over again. So they were going to uh, ask Congress to pass legislation to break the grip of the money trust. In other words, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to put laws in place to regulate the banking and financial industry on behalf of the American people instead of on behalf of the financiers. That was the whole idea. And so basically what happened, David, is, and you know the story well, but uh, the the bankers decided, you know, this is going to happen, isn't it? There's a lot of <laughs> pressure. So what are we going to do? We're going to sit back and let it happen? Well, these guys are not stupid. They're very shrewd individuals. And uh, they said, no, if there's going to be banking legislation to control our industry, let us write the legislation and not tell anybody that we wrote it. Mm -hmm. And that way we can contour it in such a way that it benefits us and actually strengthens our grip over the economy instead of accomplishing what the people think it's supposed to do. So that was a decision that was made to come together and they did exactly that was the reason for the secrecy because if anybody knew that the Federal Reserve Act – was written by the very financial interest that it was supposed to control, well, then, of course, it would never have been uh, popular. It wouldn't have passed through Congress. It would never have come to be in the form that it did. Isn't that so, always what they do? I mean, we've seen the same sort of thing with Dodd-Frank legislation. That was supposed to rein in the banks and in light of the uh, big failures that we had in 2008. And yet, as the details emerge, we're starting to see a very different picture. It looks like it was written for the benefit of the bankers. Same thing with the, quote-unquote, Affordable Health Care Act. That was going to rein and these insurance companies that were charging us too much. And now we see that their, their stock has gone up by fivefold. We see that their prices have gone up by fivefold in many cases. Yeah, right. yeah. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. Whenever, uh, whenever you uh, read the name of a piece of legislation, at least <laughs> for, for many years now, many decades, yes. Yes. If, if it has the word reform in it or affordable or, or something that sounds positive, Patriot. You, better, <laughs> you better drink another cup of coffee and start looking because you know it's going to be just the opposite yes. of what the title says. It is a Patriot Act. It's yes. the most unpatriotic thing you could possibly imagine, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Well, the, this was exactly what was going on back in 1910 through 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve. So uh, that's the history. That's, at least that's how it started the the um, the largest financial institutions in America sent their representatives to Jekyll Island. We're talking about J.P. Morgan, William Rockefeller, Kuhn Loeb, and uh, Sons and so forth. Kuhn, Kuhn Loeb. All of these people representing the biggest uh, financial interests in the world, because some of those groups had uh, very close ties uh, with Europe. Mm -hmm. And Kuhn Loeb was a representative of the Rothschild dynasty. And, of course, Max Warburg um, uh, was, was involved, tied in with the uh, Warburg dynasty in Germany and the Netherlands. And so we had really an international flavor to this whole thing. And even and J.P. Morgan. I mean, we just commemorated Armistice Day, which was Veterans Day, which was originally Armistice Day, the end of World War One, And it was J.P. Morgan that was a major financier for the French and even the British during the beginning of World War One, against the wishes of Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan. So there was yes, all yes. these, yeah, there was yeah. all this stuff well, you going on. You know the history well. Um, yeah, it, it, J.P. Morgan was... Uh, more European than he was American. Uh, you know, his roots were really in, in London and all of his um, business connections and his wealth was really derived through the Bank of England. And even though he was an American citizen, uh, his heart and his mind and his upbringing and his culture was all uh, Britain. Absolutely. And, uh, Mr. Mr. Moore, Mr. Griffin, hang on right there. We want to continue this. I want to ask you some questions about what we can do about the Fed, but we're out of time in our regular segment. We're going to be right back after the break. Well, that's the end of our show tonight, but if you're a Prison Planet subscriber, stick around for the rest of the interview. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to talk about solutions. We're going to talk about Bitcoin. We're even going to talk about the carbon credit scheme, so stay tuned. Stay tuned after the news for more special reports. Well, as we're looking at the 100th anniversary of the reauthorization of the Federal Reserve, I'm talking to G. Edward Griffin. 
probably nobody knows the history of the Federal Reserve and how we got this secretive private organization in control of our money supply than Mr. Griffin. And we were just talking about the creation of it, but we're also going to talk to him about what possibly can be done about it. Mr. Griffin, you were just talking about the creation of the Federal Reserve, how it was done in secret, and how important it is that we understand what it really is and the perverseness of these major moves that the government makes in secret. Go ahead, continue. Well, yes, uh, I think that the most important fact, uh, we don't have all day to explore these interesting uh, byways. Let's get right back to the highway again. Mm -hmm. The most important fact uh, that this history reveals is that the Federal Reserve is not really a government agency like it appears to be. Exactly. Uh, it, it appears to be a government agency because it has the force of government behind it. Its uh, edicts, its rules, its regulations uh, are uh, mandatory or we go to prison and therefore people logically would say, well, who can put you in prison except the government, you know? Mm -hmm. But what they don't realize is that behind that, the Federal Reserve is a cartel of private banking institutions and other financial institutions. It's a private banking cartel. It's a cartel. No different than a banana cartel or an oil cartel. It just happens to be a banking cartel. And the major players in that field came together back in 1913 and they drafted up their cartel agreement which was designed to preserve and expand their influence and power and then they put across the top of the agreement the, the phrase Federal Reserve Act and then they <laughs> took it to Congress and they convinced the idiots in Washington to pass it into law. That's, That's right. basically what this is all about. The well you Federal mentioned that people, Act. you mentioned that people are assuming that it's a government entity because it has the power of government and yet it has more power than our government doesn't it we just had a a poll that came out from rasmussen repeating the results that they had four years ago in 2009 2009 they had 79 percent of the people wanted to audit the fed today that's roughly the same number 74 percent within the margin of error of that poll and yet it's not happening. Why? Because the Federal Reserve doesn't want to be audited. That should tell us something right there. And we see earlier on in 2008, we were told that the banks were too big to fail. Earlier this year, the Department of Justice discovered money laundering and other crimes committed by HSBC and USB, uh, UBS, and they said that they were too big to jail. So what's going on here? I mean, it looks like they're not only do they have the power of government, they've got more power than the government has, don't they? Well, there are different ways of looking at it, of course, and uh, I guess it depends on my mood because sometimes I look at it one way, sometimes I look at it <laughs> the other way, but the, underneath all these different um, flavors, the ice cream is still basically uh, the same, and the ice cream in this case is that it is a cartel and it has captured control of the government. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you might say, well, it's become a partner with government, which is also true, but right. in, in any partnership, there's usually one partner that's more dominant than the other. And my view, as I look at it, and I go back and relook at it again and see how it's evolving, in, in my view, I think that it started off with the private uh, financial industry uh, actually working out a deal with the government to give the private banking industry certain benefits and advantages that it wouldn't have in a free market. Mm -hmm. And that gave it tremendous power and it, Using that as a platform, it just grew and grew. It had what you might call mission creep until finally now the tail is wagging the dog. In my view, I think that the financial sector, this financial industry, this uh, international banking uh, industry, if you want to call it, the cartel, now is in total control. The yes. government is its lapdog. I would and agree. Mm -hmm. And that's if once you get that picture in your mind, all of these mysterious things suddenly are answered. That's why it's happening is because these guys have literally captured our government. And we think that the government is the regulator of the banks. When in fact, the banks are the masters of the regulators. That's correct. What do we do about it then? What about okay. other alternative currencies? Are we going to wind up with a alternative currency that is merely the central bank of, let's say, China? Or are we going to have some free market alternatives like Bitcoin that are going to survive? What do you think can be done about it? 
Well, uh, you're talking now about short-term uh, uh, solutions, how we survive with it uh, mm -hmm. versus a long-term solution. Uh, if I may jump ahead, to me, the only long-term solution is to abolish this monster, to slay this creature from Jekyll Island. Because as long as it is in, in charge, if it is the master of our system, our government, and, and can force us to do anything it wants to do through the laws – that its puppets in Washington pass on its behalf, I mean, there's really nothing, there's no escape. Because somewhere down the line, there'll be uh, a point where we might figure, ah, we figured out how to escape a little bit, and they'll say, uh-uh, you can't do that, and they'll pass a law and make it illegal. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. You know, we, for right now, I think that the possession of gold is, is a very good thing to do. I, every time I have a little money put aside, I buy some gold or silver. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, but there could come a time if we don't slay this creature. Well, let's say, well, it's illegal. They'll say, oh yeah, private. private they've done that before. Come, they've they've, they've done by it fiat just yeah exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think in our minds we have to separate the difference between a long term real solution and a temporary. Well, maybe we can get by for a few months or a few years solution. Right. If you follow what I mean. Oh, that's now, right. the short yeah. the short term solution. Obviously, we need to protect ourselves as best we can to protect ourselves against the erosion of the dollar. Uh, you know, the purchasing power goes down, down, down constantly. And even though we're frugal and we try and save our money, if we're saving Federal Reserve notes and they're shrinking every day in purchasing power, we end up at the end of our lives. And we've worked hard and we thought we had a huge nest egg, but all it is is a little grain of sand instead of right. an egg. It doesn't right. do anything. And as so, long as the Fed has control of the money supply and they can print uh, money, and they can go in and manipulate both the gold market and the Bitcoin market. Or they can, the feds can come in and shut down alternative currency markets. And so wh where do we go with this? Because we've already seen that Eric Holder said he's not going to prosecute these banks that have obviously engaged in criminal activity. So clearly there doesn't seem to be anything there in Washington from either party that's really pushing hard against the Fed. Well, where do you see it happening? Yeah, it's because both parties are firmly in the pockets of the mm -hmm. financial industry. And that's, we're back to that again. Once we recognize the reality, the really harsh, ugly reality, nobody wants to face that because if that's true, well, then it seems like there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. If that's true, it seems like there's nothing we can do. Well, there is something we can do, but uh, we don't. I don't think we should kid ourselves into thinking that it's going to be easy. N power never gives itself uh, up. You know, it never just says, "Okay, you that's win. Right. You, you got the superior argument, so we're just going to give up our power." That's right. That's <laughs> right. You, you caught us. We've been lying to you and <laughs> yeah, stealing from you for a century. To. So oh, now we quit. We, so what's going to happen? <laughs> what's the what's the positive hope in all of this that you see? Well. Uh, Okay. I think that the, the positive hope is that we still can, in spite of the, the uh, progression of this uh, terrible situation, and, and the, the, I think we're coming right down to the end game, as uh, they call it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in spite of all that, I still think we have the, enough room to begin, at least, to recapture the system and begin to turn it around. Uh, you, you can do that. You can't do it with guns and bullets and bayonets, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, because these people, through the military forces, have fantastically effective weapons mm -hmm. that are not in the hands of uh, the people, you know. Right. Uh, so it, this isn't a hot kind of a revolution. This is a revolution of the mind. Yes. And so how do we do that? How do we recapture the system without trying to attack it frontally militarily, mm -hmm. which won't work? Well, the only thing left really is to take it back pretty much the same way we lost it. How did we lose this system? Did they come in and invade us? Did, did soldiers come in wearing uniforms with swastikas or some kind of an emblem on their shoulder? No. They took over our system from the inside using a very specific strategy – which they actually teach. Uh, they've been talking about this strategy for many, many decades, and it's, it's what they call taking it over from the inside, uh, capturing the power centers of society, uh, the leadership level. Mm -hmm. they, they have theorized long ago that people have a herd instinct and they follow leaders, which is true. Mm -hmm. uh, even leaders tend to follow stronger leaders. That's the way humans are. And so rather than dominate every individual one-on-one, -on -one, they realize that all they have to do is control the mass organizations to which people belong or the leaders 
uh, which have leaders that they follow, and that that way they can control the masses. What am I talking about? I'm talking about political parties. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about labor unions, church organizations, mass media organizations, the, those, those power centers that influence public thinking. And uh, when people say, well, our leaders did this, and since, it's, since I voted for him, he must represent me, and all that sort of thing that goes on in their minds, most of which is not true, but that's what we've been led to think. They know that if they can capture the control of these organizations at the top, then everybody will follow and that's what they have done. When you look at the, the political parties, for example, we've been talking about those. Why is it that no matter which party is in power, nothing really changes? Mm -hmm. It's because they're controlled at the top, at the very top. I'm not talking about the rank and file, the people that go to the conventions, the ones right. that are out there waving the flags. And all. They're just cannon fodder. They're being used by the leaders at the top. Uh, political parties are probably the most important power centers of society. But then take a look at the media centers. Mm -hmm. This is the way you can control public opinion. Take a look at the universities and the school systems. Yes, absolutely. Wherever you look, the really powerful ones, and you go to the top, at the very top, what do you find? You find people who are collectivist in thinking, they're militant, they know what they want to do, they're in total agreement with the system we have now. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find anybody at the tops of these organizations that want any serious change at all because they've got exactly what they want now. So how did they get there? Well, mainly because they knew that they had to be there and we, on the other hand, weren't even aware that they were trying to do that. We mm -hmm. were out busy enjoying our lives and having a good old time. And then we wake up one morning and say, my goodness, how did this happen? Everybody at the top wants something and we know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So now back to the question, what do we do about it? It is possible, I am totally convinced, for us to go back into these power centers of society. And if we work together and organize and network and have a common creed, we know what we believe in, what we want, as well as what we don't want, then we can begin to take back control of these power centers. Mm -hmm. I think it can be done. No. The question is, can it be done quickly enough? The word enough. Yes. This yeah. is the hard part. I don't think this is going to happen by the next election. That's what everybody wants to know. Right. Who can we vote for? See, they want the simple answer. What candidate? Who, who can we vote for? So once every two or four years, we can go and cast our vote, and we've discharged our responsibility of citizenship. Right. <laughs> they want that quick, easy answer, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't. It's not going to happen that way. I don't think it's going to happen that way. It has taken several generations to unwind the American system to what it is now. I think it's going to take at least a generation to bring it forward again to where it should be. I think we're looking at a generational project here. Yes. That means that we're probably not going to get it done before things get really, really bad. But it also means we can get it done. It's just going to take longer than we want, but it will happen. And I, I look at it this way. What we're doing right now, even with this interview, in a way, we're laying the foundation. We're spreading the word. We're giving a, a vision, uh, an, an enlightenment to people that maybe hadn't seen it quite this way before. And some of those people are going to become active in helping us lay the cornerstone, the foundation of this new, uh, new system that we'll build back up again. It's going to take a generation, but we're building the foundation right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. And once that process starts, and I, I know it has already started, you can't stop it. Yes, there will be a lot of hardship. There will be, there will be a lot of economic trauma. There are going to be people who are very miserable and desperate. And that's, the, that's the dangerous part because they'll look for yes. easy answers. There will be, answer. be an engineered, yeah, I'm concerned about an engineered economic collapse. But let me, yes. we're almost out of time. Let me ask you one other quick question, and that is about carbon credit schemes. Because when I look at this, it almost looks to me like a 21st century version of the Federal Reserve. Here you've got these private companies like Al Gore and this former executive from Goldman Sachs, Blood, getting together, creating Blood and Gore, and they're going to have you pay that private company an indulgence fee so that you can use and consume energy. Isn't that a lot like these central banks that we pay interest to them as they create currency at whatever rate they want to create it? 
Well, that's a very interesting uh, analogy. I think it is a lot like that because that's the very reason that these cartels always go into partnership with government mm -hmm. is so they can use the coercive uh, quality of government, the power of government to enforce uh, what they want. Uh, they, you know, the thing about cartels and monopolies is that they cannot maintain themselves unless they have the force of government on their side. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of socialists and left-leaning people and collectivists of all kinds say, you know, we got to have more government regulation, reali not realizing that it's that very government regulation that allows monopolies and cartels to survive. Because without it, they'll start to compete with each other. <laughs> exactly. And, and it seems to me like for this carbon credit, it seems like they've been, you're talking about it being an educational issue. They've been laying the groundwork for this in government schools and throughout the media for quite some time, creating uh -huh. this sense of alarm and concern about the climate so that they can then present this false alternative in the same way that J.P. Morgan and other bankers had created these massive cycles of boom and bust and then offered the Federal Reserve as a solution to it. And we saw that that was rapidly followed by the Great Depression. So I mean, it's not really a solution to it, but it's they, they create a problem and then offer the solution, don't they? It's a very controlled yeah. mechanism. Well, that, that is the trick right there. Problem and solution is, is uh, it's a scientific um, yes. study. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a science, some, somewhat of an art, but mostly a science. It's, it's done very well. So there you have it. The Federal Reserve is part of that mechanism. They created um, the economic crisis we're in. And now the very people who did it are coming to the fore and they're saying, OK, we've got the solution. More of the same. Yes, we'll have, exactly. We'll create more money out of nothing, and we'll have more government regulation, so that means there'll be fewer loopholes for you folks to escape. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Griffin. It's been a fascinating interview, filling us in on the history of the Federal Reserve, and we see the pattern happening over and over again, and we can only hope that uh, your efforts, and they've been fantastic efforts, will help to awaken people to what's really going on, that we'll see an audit of the Fed, that people really understand where it came from, what it's doing to us. All right, I'll do my best, and I know you will, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And we'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is a proposed free trade agreement that will literally sign the globe over to corporate control. And as it stands, we the people who will be most affected by this contract won't be able to see how our sovereignty and our planet is being raped and ransacked in the name of potential profit margin until it is too late. TPP negotiations have taken place under a freakish cloak of secrecy, denying all but a very few any input into the terms of the agreement. The only people who have had access to the negotiations are 600 advisors, none of whom work for Congress, and 500 of which are corporate lobbyists. Even though the press, the public, and most members of Congress haven't seen details of the negotiations, the Obama administration hopes to fast-track the TPP by the end of this year. And the Obama administration has categorized the deal as classified information. Congressman Alan Grayson was permitted to review the document after filing a Freedom of Information Act. However, he was not allowed to comment on it. Here is what he did have to say about the TPP. The result will be so soon evident to everybody. When the agreement does get released, you'll see massive giveaways of our sovereignty, um, massive efforts to undermine the middle class in this country, massive efforts to keep us from making the decisions that we need to do to make ourselves safe, to keep ourselves healthy, and to actually have the kind of life we want to have. Why? Because we've given the entire process over to special interests. It's no longer even properly called a trade agreement. Uh, it's an anti-sovereignty agreement. It has very little, if anything, to do with trade at this point. And the fact that something like this can be negotiated in secret for over three years, it is an indication of how far our standards have fallen. Uh, I can't remember any time earlier in our history when we would have done this. I can't remember any time earlier in our history when we'd even make an effort to say that we couldn't have amendments on the floor of the House or the Senate about something that's so crucial to the way that we conduct our lives in the future. So what's so bad about the Trans-Pacific Partnership that it's being labeled as NAFTA on steroids? 
Well, the chapters that have been leaked reveal plans that would threaten public health, the environment. Are you an internet user? Of course you are. Well, forget about CISPA, SOPA, and PIPA. The TPP rolls all those regulations up into one global agreement that totally circumvents domestic laws. File downloads could be criminalized and your internet service provider would become a copyright enforcer, meaning your ISP address could monitor and police your every move using a three-strike system. After those three strikes, your access to the internet could be cut off, including your own personal website, which could be deleted. And the TPP's rules on copyright infringement directly affect anyone who shares information via the web. Fair use exceptions could be severely restricted, effectively crippling any sharing of news and videos via YouTube and other platforms. Pharmaceutical companies can institute longer patents that would preserve their monopolies and reduce access to affordable medications. The TPP includes foreign investor protections, which could help corporations offshore jobs. Negotiations include financial deregulation and loss of oversight that could lead to even worse financial meltdowns than what we've experienced. And perhaps the most crippling sovereign countries. Foreign corporations could pummel nations financially if that nation considers a domestic law that will curb expected future profits. For instance, if a country refuses to grow GMO crops, rather than respecting that nation's sovereignty, Biotech giants can sue the country for cutting into their profits, and then international tribunals could impose economic sanctions on that country until their ban on GMOs is lifted. This is a huge concern for citizens all over the world, so why aren't these contracts being made available for public review? Well, a group hopes to do a little crowdsourcing and expose this contract. Just Foreign Policy has launched a free TPP campaign to reward WikiLeaks if it is able to make the negotiating text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership public. So far, the group has raised more than $50,000 from concerned citizens who refuse to acquiesce while corporate cronies decide our fate. We have got to call our representatives and demand that they find out what is inside the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We have to know what's in store for us so we can do something about it before it is too late. Reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News, I'm Leanne McAdoo.